A person that has been doing wonderful work for many, many years is Jeffrey Sachs. We all know of him, and we're very honored to have him here with us today from, from New York via Zoom. And Jeffrey Sachs is a um, professor of sustainable development at Columbia in New York, the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He's also a professor of health policy, policy and management at Columbia School of Public Health. Um, and as of 2017, uh, Jeffrey Sachs serves as special advisor to the UN, uh, UN Sec General, Sec General Secretary uh, on the Sustainable Development Goals. So with us here from New York, we have Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Please give him a warm hand. <laughs> Wonderful to see you. And you will talk about that it's now time to tear down the walls. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, but really, the honor is for me. This is such a wonderful, wonderful event. Very powerful and very important and, and also so well done. Uh, of course, uh, we don't have time. That is your theme. That's the world's reality. And the IPCC 1.5 degree report is very helpful in laying out the science extremely clearly. We're just at, at the end of the time when we can have even uh, relative uh, safety of the climate. We're at the verge of uh, a runaway climate. Uh, temperatures have increased by 1.1 degree C compared to the pre-industrial level. Uh, we have a lot of built-in warming remaining uh, in order to achieve the Paris climate agreement uh, limit of 1.5 degrees C, we need uh, worldwide decisive action now. And we need to sustain that action through the mid-century and then beyond. Uh, the IPCC lays out very clearly the basic point. We need to end net emissions of greenhouse gases by mid-century, and then move to negative emissions in the second half of the 21st century, largely through biological storage of carbon in the biosphere. Now, this is an achievable objective. Of course, we're way off track from actually achieving it, but the basics are very, very clear. And the core of this is to move to a zero carbon energy system. And the core of that is also clear. We need 100% zero carbon electricity as the very basic part of the energy system. We need to electrify as much as can be electrified, especially vehicles, for example, and home and building heating. And we need to use the electricity, the clean electricity, for the sectors that cannot be directly electrified to produce synthetic fuels that can be used in a zero carbon manner. For example, there are three processes that are well discussed and well understood for using clean electricity to produce uh, gases and liquids uh, as synthetic fuels. Most uh, basically, uh, clean electricity can be used through hydrolysis to produce hydrogen, which can then be put into fuel cells for trucks uh, and for large ocean going vessels. We can use uh, hydrogen combined with direct air capture of carbon dioxide to produce synthetic liquids that can be used in aviation fuel. And we can also use direct air capture of CO2 plus uh, hydrogen to make uh, synthetic or green methane, which can be used in a number of industrial processes and even in closed loop gas fired power plants that capture their own CO2 and then recycle it into synthetic methane using renewable energy. I was happy to co-host a meeting 
at the Fondazione Eni Enrico Mattei in Milan, Italy, just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, which brought together top engineers from around the world. They were very, very clear. The pathway to zero carbon electricity and zero carbon energy overall by 2050 is uh, known. It's not simple because some of the technologies, uh, the synthetic gases and liquids need to be commercialized. They need to be scaled up. Costs need to be reduced. But there's no profound mystery in how we can put ourselves on the path to zero by mid-century. There is, of course, in addition to the energy sector, a major land use challenge. We have to turn from net deforestation and net emissions of carbon dioxide and, of course, other greenhouse gases to net uh, capture uh, and biological storage of greenhouse gases as well. So that is another pillar of reaching zero by 2050 and then moving to net negative after 2050. The key here is sustainable land use. The key is to end deforestation. The key is to tell President Bolsonaro in Brazil, no, uh, you are not going to tear down the Amazon for your strange ideas about, quote, development uh, that are socially and environmentally destructive and perhaps helping your rich and powerful friends, but not the planet and not the people that live in the Amazon. And similarly, in the other rainforest the basins, the Congo Basin and uh, the uh, Indonesian, uh, Malaysian uh, rainforest region, we need sustainable land use. We also need to reforest, afforest, and restore degraded lands. The point I'm making is that the path to zero and then afterwards to negative is known. We now need to ensure that every government makes such a plan. They are called upon to make such a plan in the Paris Climate Agreement, Article 4.19. Every country is to submit a low emission development strategy to mid-century. This is the time that these plans are needed. The Scandinavian countries, of course, uh, have made such plans. We need European-wide plans to get to zero. We need plans all over the world by every government. We need to press China to make the Belt and Road Initiative a net zero initiative by mid-century. Stop with the coal-fired power plants. Stop with the oil pipelines. We support the Belt and Road Initiative, we can say to the Chinese leadership, but only if it is clean and sustainable. So this is my core message. Uh, the technology is at hand. The science is absolutely clear. The need, the purpose, the economical path is known. Now we have to help our politicians do the right thing. They don't understand necessarily technically. They need to get the plans at the national and regional level in order now that we cannot wait indeed. Thank you very much for letting me share these thoughts with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey Sachs, for laying it out so clearly uh, for us. Um, but even so, as we listen to you, um, we hear, we understand that the techniques are already there. We need just to commercialize them and scale them up. Um, what is hindering? What are, we understand from your speech that we need to, to vote the right politicians into office. But what else needs to happen for these techniques to really be rolled out uh, to be carbon free? Well, there are two big problems. One is that in most of the world, the politicians simply don't understand mm. 
the options are available for low cost, feasible, technologically sound and reliable decarbonization. They just don't know. Uh, they were not trained in this activity. The other fundamental problem is corruption. Mm -hmm. The corruption comes from the oil, gas and coal industry. It is pervasive. The United States is a thoroughly corrupt political system where the oil and gas industry pays the Congress and pays the politicians to say nonsense. The only good news I can tell you is the American politicians, maybe with the exception of the president, is not as stupid as they look. They are incredibly corrupt, though. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. Canada, the same story. It is Alberta that destroys progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, Australia, it is the corruption of the oil industry, and sorry, the coal industry, egged on by Rupert Murdoch, one of the most despicable people on the planet, I'm sorry to say, because he propounds really harmful ideas through his media empire. Mm -hmm. But corruption in Australia is absolutely massive. This is what we're really facing, small powerful, rich, vested interests fighting against the common good of the whole planet and future generations. But we need to educate the people that we have a practical path forward and we need to help the politicians who are not trained in technology to understand this. And then we need absolutely to fight resolutely uh, against these uh, corrupt practices and these powerful interests. We are uh, launching uh, the We Don't Have Time platform today. And I would say that this platform has exactly the power, that it is a tool to unleash the power, to unveil all these, uh, <clears throat> I'm almost using a bad word here, but the people in the, these positions that block the change. So what is your take on how, what, a, what a role can this platform chain, uh, play in, the, in this transformation? I think that uh, the young people have changed the global politics and that's not going to go away. So mm. we are right now at the tipping point. Uh, we need to get the engineers to speak clearly. Yes, it can be done. We need to educate the politicians who are not educated in this to understand what can be done. And then we need to point very clearly at the Murdochs of the world, the Trumps of the world, uh, the Jamie Dimons uh, of J.P. Morgan, who funds so much of the fossil fuel industry. We need to call it out. Mm. Who is destroying the planet? And they just have to clear away because we are not going to let the planet be destroyed for narrow, selfish, stupid reasons. Mm.